Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can I welcome all of you, both uh, those of you who are here in the room, here at Blackstone Chambers, and those of you who are online on Zoom. Um, I'm Ruth Fox, I'm the director of the Hansel Society, um, and I'm uh, here today with uh, Professor Tom Hickman, a barrister here at, uh, at Blackstone Chambers, who specialises in a number of areas, but particularly constitutional and public law, hence our, our discussion today. Um, Tom and I are having this discussion because there's an important uh, regulation that's going to be considered by both Houses of Parliament at the beginning of next week. Um, and Tom wrote uh, an excellent blog post on it for the UK Constitutional Law Association highlighting a number of the constitutional issues and concerns that arise in relation to the regulations. So we thought it was a really good opportunity um, for us to have a discussion about the, this particular case and the very specific constitutional concerns it raises, um, and also a broader discussion about delegated legislation and its, its scrutiny by Parliament, which is something that the Hansel Society has been concerned about for a very long time, and, uh, and Tom has a particular interest in as well. So we're discussing the Public Order Act 1986 Serious Disruption to Life if the Community Regulations in advance of the debate. Um, they would lower the threshold for what constitutes serious disruption that should be applied by the police when determining whether and what kind of restrictions on protests, uh, processions and assemblies and so on. The kind of slow walk type of process that we've seen from Extinction Rebellion, Just Stop Oil and so on. The government wants to lower that threshold from significant and prolonged disruption to anything that amounts to more than minor disruption. And ministers argue they need to ensure consistency on the statute book. Um, there are now a couple of different definitions of what constitutes serious disruption, and these re regulations are designed to bring about that consistency and clarity. But this, this discussion today that Tom and I are going to have and that we're going to take questions on is not actually about the merits or not of public protest. It's not about the merits of what the government specifically is proposing. It's much more about the broader constitutional and political implications and procedural implications of this case and why it matters and why we should be concerned. Um, so uh, with that, um, we are going to break our discussion up, I think, into sort of five broad themes, just to give you a sense of how we're going to structure it today. Um, first of all, Tom's going to talk about the legislative context and sort of legislative logistics that apply because it's, it's a little bit complicated. It involves three acts of parliament, a statutory instrument, Henry VIII's powers. So we're going to spend a little bit of time unpicking that. How have we got here? Why does the government want to do uh, what it wants and, and why? We're then going to talk about why this case is constitutionally novel and important and talk about the sort of the, the political and constitutional questions that arise. And then we're going to look specifically at what we think is going to happen next Monday and Tuesday when it's debated in the House of Commons and the, the House of Lords. Are these regulations going to be approved or rejected given the constitutional concerns? And if so, what kind of precedents might it set for the future? What does the case tell us about the relationship between Parliament uh, and the executive? And particularly, what does the case tell us about the relationship between the House of Lords and the House of Commons and the House of Lords and, and, and the government? In terms of managing this, we're joined by a few people here in Blackstone Chambers in person, and uh, but the majority of people are online. So just in terms of how we're going to manage questions, um, those of you who are online can submit questions anytime. Uh, you can do that using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll find at the bottom of your, your screen. And rather than keeping all the questions to the end, I've got a colleague here, Bridget Fowler, in the, here with me, who's in my line of sight and is going to flag up if there are particularly pertinent questions relating to where we've got to in our conversation so that we can come in at the appropriate moment. And otherwise, we'll tackle them at the end of each sort of section of the, the discussion as we go through. There are a lot of people signed up to this uh, online, so we may not get through all the questions. We'll do our best. And if not, if we, if we may need to come back to some of them, um, perhaps send an email out later today uh, if there is anything that really important that we don't, we don't get to. Um, you can upvote questions online. Um, uh, and if, if somebody else has already asked the question so that you don't have to duplicate it. Can I ask you not to use the, uh, the chat functionality for questions because that's not what we're monitoring. We're monitoring uh, the, the Q&A. Um, closed captioning is enabled on Zoom, so you can also turn that on if you need it at the bottom of your screen. 
Um, we're not live tweeting the event, but there is a hashtag serious disruption that you can use to engage. Um, and colleagues will also be tweeting out some resources relevant to this during the, the course of the discussion and, and at the end. Um, so with that, uh, and just to say to those in the room that you can ask a question by waving your hand, <laughs> make, make life a bit easier. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn to Tom and say, can you explain where we are, how we've got here? What, what is the legislative context background to this? Okay, well, first of all, thanks very much for um, inviting me in, uh, to speak and to uh, contribute in this way. I think it's a great opportunity, um, not only to talk about this particular issue, but also to just broaden awareness about statutory instruments, because um, statutory instruments are um, the, the way that most law in this country is, is actually made. Um, so most of the laws that uh, apply, most of the legislation is not actually made by Parliament. Uh, it's made by statutory instrument. And statutory instruments are um, executive measures. I mean, that's very clear. So although we're going to discuss a little bit about Parliament's role in um, approving, scrutinising statutory instruments, um, it's, it's important to bear in mind that they are executive measures. That is to say, they're, they're government uh, instruments. They're made by the government in law. That is very, very clear. Um, and while they do sometimes have to pass through a parliamentary procedure, um, they are not enacted or made by um, Parliament. So they are laws, and most laws in this country are made, therefore, by the government, by the executive, um, and not by a legislative um, body. Um, so that's the, that's the context uh, in terms of statutory instruments. Um, it, it, let me try and piece the jigsaw together a little bit. So there's, a, there's an interrelationship here between uh, primary legislation, which is legislation that is made by Parliament and enacted by Parliament, and delegate legislation, which is the, the statutory instrument. The, the starting point is the Public Order Act 1986, uh, which lays down various provisions uh, for controlling um, processions uh, and protests and, and other activities that can raise public order issues sets out offences, uh, and it also sets out police powers uh, that allow the police to um, impose conditions or prohibitions on processions um, and protests and so forth. And that, that law came into effect in 1986. Um, important changes were made to that law in uh, 2022 by the Police Crime uh, Sentencing and Courts Act 2022, bit of a mouthful. Um, and one of the things that that law did, and that was another act of parliament, so that was a, a, a piece of primary legislation, not a statutory instrument, enacted by parliament. Uh, and one of the things that that did is it set out um, examples of what serious disruption, which is the trigger for um, the offences and police powers under the Public Order Act, uh, examples of what, what that would entail. But it also um, included provisions that allowed the government, by statutory instrument, to make further provision about um, the, uh, the meaning of serious disruption, examples um, and um, changes to the definition and the meaning of the term um, serious disruption. So it allowed the government to do that by statutory instrument. I'll return to that in a minute, because that's very important. Uh, so that was in 2022. What we then had was um, a, another public order bill um, that was going through, that went through Parliament um, this year, 2023, and became the Public Order Act 2023. The Public Order Act 2023 um, made certain amendments to the Public Order Act 1986, uh, and in particular, it lowered the threshold. I'm going to simplify a bit. We can get into details later if we need to. But it lowered the threshold, essentially, of serious disruption for the purposes of offences under the Public Order Act to things that are more than minor. Um, and we can, it's a bit more detailed, a bit more complex than that, but essentially that's what it, what it did. But it didn't change the threshold for the exercise of police powers. Um, amendments were laid uh, to the bill 
introduced in the House of Lords that would have lowered the threshold in relation to police powers uh, under the Public Order Act in the same way, essentially a more than minor threshold. But um, the House of Lords rejected uh, those amendments. Um, they were not approved. And so it never formed part uh, of the 2023 Act. And those amendments were never made uh, to the Public Order Act 1986. Now, just the final piece of the jigsaw and the critical thing is that what then happened is that the, the government uh, drafted a statutory instrument using the powers that have been conferred in 2022. Remember that piece of legislation with the uh, long name, the Police um, uh, uh, Crime Sentencing and Courts Act um, 2022, which uh, gave the government some delegated powers to make statutory instruments to change the definitions uh, in the Public Order Act. And the government drafted um, regulations that would have that effect and that would effectively achieve what the government had been unable to achieve through the Public Order Act 2023 by delegated legislation. And those are the regulations we're considering because uh, it, before they can take effect, uh, they have to be approved by each House of, of Parliament, which is what will probably happen uh, early next week. If it does happen and the regulations take effect, then subject to any legal challenge, um, uh, the government will, by delegated legislation, executive legislation, have achieved what it could not achieve uh, by primary legislation in 2023. It, it will have achieved through the back door, essentially, that which it could not achieve uh, through the front door. So I hope that's <laughs> so a summary. I'm not sure about a summary, but it's a, it's a fairly complicated uh, uh, context. It is, um, it is. Um, let's just unpack that a bit in terms of what happened earlier this year in the Public Order Act. So yes. what, uh, what happens that the government, the, the bill had been through the Commons, completed all its common stages, gone to the Lords, and at a fairly late stage, report stage, a government amendment is laid to uh, introduce this wording around minor disruptions. So the first question is that, you know, in terms of preparation of policy, um, it's quite late in the day um, and the MPs have not scrutinised it. So it's very, to be very clear, MPs have never looked at this particular question, but, but peers did. There was quite an extensive debate at the end of January about it. There was, there was, they were fairly evenly split, um, but when they voted on the specific amendments, Peers rejected them by 254 votes to 240, I think it was. Um, and um, I mean, an interesting aspect of this is it partly comes about because um, prior to uh, 2022, as I understand it, um, the, the, um, the, the description, the interpretation of what constitutes serious disruption was left to the courts and the police. And actually, it's Parliament specifically House of Lords committees, wanting to put more flesh on the bone in a bill about what constitutes that, that has led to these kinds of amendments through the, the over the last couple of years. So it's an interesting thing where the government is wanting more detail on the bill, but that, sorry, the parliament is wanting more detail on the bill, and that then leads to um, the, the, the dilemma in which we now find ourselves with the, with, with the regulations next week. Um, just to set the, the scene in terms of the timings, though, um, the, uh, the, the amendment was lost in early February in the House of Lords. Um, the bill completed its final scrutiny stages on the 26th of April this year. It got royal assent on 2nd of May. The regulations were laid before Parliament the day after the passage of the bill was completed, 27th of April. So the government didn't mess about in terms of timings. It's come straight back with these uh, with these provisions, um, and you know that then this is where we we end up. You talked you talked Tom about um, the, the fact that these are executive powers that effectively ministers have been granted powers in a in a in an act to make by regulations the definitions. Do you want to talk about from your perspective as a from from your legal perspective what you think of that? It's, it, it goes to the nub of the debate about what, what ministers should be able to do by executive powers. Where's the line between what should be in primary legislation and what should be in delegated legislation? 
Yes. Okay. So there's, there's. I think there's two, at least two um, elements to that question. Um, I mean, first of all, um, in terms of where the line should be drawn, there's no, um, there's no. We don't have any constitutional document or any um, piece of legislation that sets out um, how delegated legislation should be used. Uh, that contrasts with lots of other countries that do have those sorts of um, provisions. Um, there, there has in the past been a sort of, I mean, going back a fair way now, but there used to be a sort of convention that um, policy would not be included in delegated legislation, that it, delegated legislation would only be used to implement policy. So the policy would have to be approved by Parliament in primary legislation, and, and then delegated legislation would be used uh, essentially to implement that. But that distinction has disappeared and there's no doubt now that delegated legislation is used to change policy in quite fundamental ways and I think you could certainly look at these regulations as an example of that. Um, now in terms of the broader constitutional context and maybe we'll talk about this a bit more mm -hmm. in a minute but just it's worth just flagging up that one of the real issues here is the fact that um, you have a delegated power that's created by Parliament 2022, but then you have a subsequent um, act, 2023 Act, and subsequent consideration by Parliament. And that creates a sort of constitutional issue, constitutional tension, because um, constitutionally, Parliament uh, always, you always look at the last thing that Parliament had to say. Anything that Parliament says um, trumps anything that it said before. And so the fact that Parliament might have granted broad powers in 2022 is, in a sense, con constitutionally superseded by the fact that in 2023, Parliament has looked at a, a particular policy issue, here the meaning of serious disruption and police powers, and it's debated that issue and it's passed primary legislation um, which deals with that issue in the broad sense and it hasn't included the changes. And that's why we get a constitutional tension, because constitutionally, you would say, well, that's the most recent expression of Parliament's will. Now, you might say, just to complete this point, um, well, Parliament's going to have another look at this next week. And then that will be the most recent expression of Parliament's <laughs> will. But uh, unfortunately, the, the other critical constitutional principle is that Parliament speaks through primary legislation. That's the expression of parliamentary sovereignty. Um, and, and go back to a point that I made at the very outset, delegate legislation, statutory instruments, um, are um, expressions of executive will. And therefore, although Parliament does have a role in looking at them and sometimes approving them, that is not the same as Parliament enacting primary legislation or considering primary legislation. It's not a sovereign act of Parliament, okay? Um, and, and that's reflected in the fact that, that Parliament's um, scrutiny and ability to look at delegated legislation is far more restricted, both in terms of the time and the um, resources devoted to it, but also in terms of the conventions that surround and limit the role of Parliament in um, scrutinising secondary legislation. So yes, Parliament's going to look at it again next week, but that is not the same type of look constitutionally as it had when the 2023 bill was, was passing through Parliament. Just to follow from that, I mean, the critical thing with SIs is they're not amendable, unlike primary legislation. And, and it'll be a 90-minute debate next week unless a business motion is passed in the Commons to extend it. Um, and I mean... <laughs> It's going to be debated unusually in the House of Commons chamber. Most of these are debated in delegated legislation committees of sort of 17 MPs uh, on the committee corridor. Some uh, of the more sort of controversial SIs do get debated in the chamber, but um, it's usually a, a delegated legislation committee. You can take your pick about why they're being debated next week in the chamber. Um, many of you may have heard there's, there's not a lot of government business uh, going on in the Commons uh, chamber at the moment. So it's, you could say it's a time filler, or alternatively, you could say the government accepts that there's a degree of controversy around this. Um, and wants it to be sort of fairly prominent uh, in, in the chamber rather than a committee. Um, so the, the critical thing is that they're, they're, they're not amendable. So MPs and peers will be faced with a, an accept or reject proposition. 
Um, and that, that is one of the difficulties compared to primary legislation. And the secondary legislation scrutiny committee in the House of Lords, which looks at all statutory instruments that are, that are laid before the, 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 the Lords, it published a report in May on these uh, regulations and actually brought these issues to attention. It was actually, I think, off the back of the report that you did your blog post. Um, they highlight a number of issues, and one of them is that um, the government hasn't, in these regulations, responded to some of the concerns that were expressed during the debate back in January about the regulations, that, that, that about the, the amendment, that, that the government hasn't responded to the fact that peers were quite divided in their view about whether or not um, you know, the, the definition in relation to serious disruption was appropriate. And in effect, what we have a situation is the House of Lords has decided that different thresholds for what constitutes serious disruption should apply to different types of protest. Our government takes a different view and says, no, we want, we want um, the same description, the same interpretation of, of it for clarity. Um, but nowhere in the process has the government addressed those concerns in, in the House of Lords and is now presenting it a, a second time. Absolutely. So, so they identified that uh, very point. So the, the committee said, well, you know, you lost the argument in House of Lords um, and you've come back and you haven't presented any new arguments. There's no change of circumstances. You haven't, you haven't said there's some additional reason why you need to have these. They're all the same arguments that you presented to House of Lords and you lost in the House of Lords. And so and you're coming back and having another go. And um, you know, one of the reasons why this is uh, constitutionally very suspect is because um, it's much easier, bizarrely much easier, to get delegated legislation through than it is to get um, uh, primary legislation uh, through because there's much less time to scrutinise. I mean, you, you know, you've heard there's debates next week, but they're going to be very short. Um, the debate in the Commons was only announced yesterday or the day before. So it's not as if MPs have got much time to sort of gear up, gear up for it. It may, may not even be um, around. Um, but, um, but also there's a convention that the House of Lords generally does not um, reject uh, statutory instruments that have been um, uh, put before it for approval. So although theoretically it, it could reject the statutory instrument, um, there's a very powerful constitutional norm that it will not do so. The last time it did so, it, it provoked a constitutional crisis and the powers of the House of Lords over statutory instruments were almost taken away from it. And there's this sort of uh, um, ever-present threat um, that the government has uh, articulated over uh, the House of Lords that, you know, if you're going to do this again, uh, we will take steps to cut your uh, powers down. So there's that additional um, factor, which means that the government can, in a sense, push things through by statutory instrument, um, using its majority in the House of Commons, which it can't get through um, the process of um, full, um, enact, full legislation, the full le legislative process, presenting a bill, um, and so forth. And so, so really, it's not the same as having a second look by Parliament, presenting the arguments again. It's a very different context, and the role of Parliament is much more limited. Can I just go back to one point you made about, the, about statutory instruments being amendable? I mean, this is a very important point. So statutory instruments are not amendable, so they all take it or leave it. And if you cast your mind back, I know it's a sort of painful experience, but cast your mind back to the COVID uh, pandemic um, and, and think of all those rules and regulations um, that were in place about where we could go and who we could meet with and when we could leave our ha houses. All of that was um, introduced by secondary legislation, and it was constantly changing the secondary legislation. And, and that was all looked at by Parliament, but in that, in that context, after the legislation had come into effect, often months after the legislation had come into effect, and, and Parliament had no opportunity to make any changes. So even if, if Parliament had thought, well, you know, most of the, these rules are OK, but some of them go a bit too far. Parliament had no opportunity to change or amend those rules. And it's the same in any, almost any context of one or two very minor exceptions, but almost any context. So, so Parliament has to take it or leave it. So again, it's another reason why effectively the House of Lords is not going to reject 
statutory instruments that come before it because it, it, it can't just take out the bits it doesn't like. It has to, to reject the whole thing. Very different from primary legislation. Yeah, and the only two instances I'm aware of where SIs are amendable are the Census Act 1920, I think it is, and the Civil Contingencies Act. And uh, certainly Civil Contingencies Act provisions have never been used. But interestingly, we were talking earlier that the retained EU law bill that's also going through its final stages in the in the Lords, it's sort of into, into second round of ping pong between the two houses. Um, Lord Anderson of Ipswich has got a, an amendment down to introduce a provision for amendment of certain um, pieces of retained EU law that may be um, revoked under the government's plans. Um, and interestingly, um, much to my surprise, I have to say, um, there, there was a very, very substantial majority, I think he won by some 70 odd votes uh, earlier this week, to keep that provision in the bill. So it now, go, now goes back to the Commons. I'm almost certain the government, will, you know, with its majority, will say no. Um, ministers will hold out against any prospect of amendment of, of regulations. Um, and there are some real practical difficulties with it. I mean, our, our delegated legislation review that we've been undertaking for the last 18 months with a, a distinguished advisory panel bringing together um, some odd political bedfellows, I think you'd say. Um, Steve Baker was originally on our advisory council, um, arch Brexiteer, Dame Angela Eagle, arch Remainer, uh, Kirsty Blackman from the SNP, and we've had a, a, a number of crossbench peers as well, uh, crossbench peers and, and, and Labour and uh, Conservative peers on it. Um, we concluded that the amendment of the direct text of statutory instruments is incredibly complicated because you end up with the prospect of ping pong on statutory instruments. I mean, the, the circumstances in which you'd amend an SI, I think you want to be few and far between. So it's a sort of a, a thing that should be done exceptionally. But even if you're doing it exceptionally, you need a process to manage it. Um, it's not clear to me what the process would be under the retained EU law bill, because that will have to be done in standing orders. But um, but that concern about you know extended dialogue between the two houses over regulations is problematic. So our solution was that you don't amend the actual text of the regulation, but you don't give automatic immediate approval to the regulations. You amend the motion, the approval motion, indicating that. Um, we will agree to these regulations subject to the government doing X, Y, and Z. And then it, the government can, come, can go away and consider that and then come back and give a view as to whether it accepts those proposals. And it's then for the House to decide whether that is satisfactory to them or not. So it's, it's, a, it's a different workaround to achieve the same objective, but without uh, significantly extending the time period and, and, and taking up an awful lot more parliamentary time. Um, Going back to um, the, the acts, one of the things that has come up in questions to me uh, over the last few days that people have put to me, this involves one of those Henry VIII powers, um, which get a lot of attention, particularly among campaigners. It's just sort of, you know, oh, terrible, you know, despotic monarch. This is what the powers the government's using. Mm. Um, People have different views on Henry VIII powers. Some think they're a useful tool. Um, others, like Lord Judge, Convener, former convener of the crossbench peers, former distinguished uh, judge, he would, I think, consign them to the dustbin of history is the phrase that he uses. Um, what's your thoughts on Henry VIII powers, Tom? So, so Henry VIII power is, is a power um, that's conferred by Parliament um, on the government to, but not always on the government, could be on anybody. Um, uh, and sometimes it is conferred on other, on other bodies um, to make changes to primary legislation. Um, and that is controversial because um, on one rather strict view of parliamentary sovereignty, um, there should be no way that a, an act of parliament can be uh, amended or changed uh, other than by another act of parliament. Um, but that is rather inconvenient. So um, they have these delegated powers. Where they get particularly controversial is in relation to what's called retrospective Henry VIII powers. Um, and that, that is a, um, a Henry VIII power uh, that allows um, the government to change uh, the content of an act of parliament that is passed after the date uh, that the Henry VIII power has been conferred. So if you think back to the points I was making earlier about 
orthodox constitutional thinkings, Parliament's subsequent, most recent expression of its will prevails over anything it said in said before. Well, if Parliament um, confers a very broad Henry VIII power and subsequently enacts legislation, and in fact the previously conferred Henry VIII power confers power within its terms allows amendments to a, a latter um, act of Parliament, um, that is obviously a, a, a rather different uh, thing. And that happens. Um, the courts have still haven't really looked uh, at those powers, but they exist and they're used quite frequently. Um, and that is that is particularly controversial. I have to say those those sorts of powers I have particular problems Excellent. with. Yeah. Yep. Um, I know we've got quite a few questions, but most of them, I think, at the moment are about um, what's going to happen next, which is our, our, our next trend. So we'll come to those. But is, Bridget, I'm looking, is there anything on what we've covered so far that's pertinent that we should pick up? Um, I, I don't think so. Well, there was a question about Henry VIII's powers which, um, and Lord Judge's views thereon. Um, so I think we've covered that. No, we've got several questions, people interested in what might happen next week and what the implications okay. of that might be. And we will possibly a heads up to Tom. There are some questions on possible grounds for legal challenge to these regs that I suggest we leave. Yeah, them we'll come to that. Time and time yeah. Okay. So, thinking about what's going to happen next week, so they're going to be debated in the House of Commons on Monday in the Commons Chamber. They'll be deba debated in the House of Lords on Tuesday. Now, in the Commons, it'll be a straight, you know, straight up or down. Do you approve this? Uh, these regulations. Um, as Tom said out earlier, um, the Commons has not considered this issue previously because it, the, the amendment wasn't in the Public Order Bill at the time that it scrutinised it. So this will be new territory to them. So um, there are actually some MPs signed up to today's uh, webinar. So hopefully they will pass it on to their colleagues and um, a quick a quick hour to learn exactly um, the detail of it in the background and why it's constitutionally important. Um, I, the interest certainly amongst the campaigners has been very much focused on the House of Lords. And um, the government obviously is putting forward a motion to approve the regulations. And we've then got two other uh, amendments to the motion. Um, one is what's called a, a regret motion, but it is non-fatal. It won't stop the regulations uh, coming into effect. And the other is a what's called a fatal motion that will, will kill them. So. Um, the first motion uh, was laid by Baroness Jones of Moulscombe, the Green, peer, uh, Green Party peer, and she wants, primarily because of the constitutional concerns, though I, 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 you know, she will have concerns about this in relation to protests, but, um, but specifically she raises the constitutional concerns. She wants the House to decline to approve the regulations, so this, is, this would kill the instrument stone dead. Um, it would appear she wants them to vote no and tell the government no, we're not, we're not having these. Um, the uh, Labour Party up here, Lord Coker, has laid the non-fatal motion, which is a motion of regret, and he expresses in his motion various reasons about why uh, he regrets that the government is, is bringing forward these regulations, among them the constitutional concerns. Um, but that's as far as it goes. It would not stop the regulations coming into, in, into effect if peers were to vote for that motion. So that's going to be the tension on Tuesday. Um, what do I think is going to happen? Um, precisely because the, the um, main opposition party has laid a non-fatal regret motion, um, that uh, is, is you know, going to take precedence over the, the, the fatal motion because... I, Presumably, um, you know, the, the opposition is not going to vote. The official opposition is not going to vote for Baroness Jones's fatal motion to kill the regulations. So I think they will go through. Um, but what's going to be interesting is what kind of debate takes place in, in the Lords about this. Because it is this, this the novel situation we are in that should the government, should ministers be able to bring forward a policy proposal that the hack that Parliament in whichever, which, whichever house, has already rejected earlier in the same session or indeed earlier in the same parliament, and do so by regulations rather than primary legislation, which are not amendable. Um, 
often delegated legislation is subject to less scrutiny. Um, I don't think you can argue that in this case, because there's an awful lot of scrutiny going on in terms of these regulations, albeit not um, no more than usual in, in, in um, Parliament, specifically in the House of Lords. I think you made a good point in your blog post, Tom, that, you know, the majority of statutory instruments are not subject to automatic debate and an approval vote in uh, each house. But actually, a lot of regulations go, go through under what's called the negative procedure um, and, you know, don't require automatic um, debate. And you could see circumstances in which this might happen and regulations go through in that way and, and wouldn't get this kind of uh, kind of scrutiny and, and, and broader discussion. Um, I think it also engages a really interesting question, procedural question, possibly about precedence, that there is a rule in each house um, that you don't, that the house won't consider um, the same question twice. Um, the, 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 it's called the same question rule in, in Erskine May. Um, the idea being that you, you can't, once, once the house has made a decision, it applies in, in each house, once the House has made a decision, you can't browbeat them and waste parliamentary time by keep putting the same question to them, to encourage them to vote for it or to change their minds um, within the same session. Um, sort of interesting question of why doesn't that, why isn't this engaged in the in the House of Lords? Um, the differences, I think, are either interesting that in the House of Commons, it would be the, the speaker that would have to, to rule on whether or not the same question was engaged. In the House of Lords, the, the, the law speaker has different, different powers. Mm. Um, so the House would have to find a way to, to uh, make known that it thought the same rule question was engaged. But precisely the fact that the Commons is going to vote on it the day before, on the Monday, arguably changes the context, something new has happened, such that, um, you know, the substance of the discussion and the, and the decision are different to what they were in January when the House of Commons hadn't considered them. So um, I don't think that that will be engaged, but it, it raises a uh, possible concern in relation to precedent for the future, that if the government can bring forward amendments at a late stage in the House of Lords, which are then defeated, it can then bring forward the same thing in regulations and it can't be stopped from doing so via the same question rule because the House of Commons has voted on it earlier. Um, that's a bit of a workaround, it seems to be, procedurally. So it, it, I, think, I think there's going to be some interesting dis issues for the potentially the House of Commons Procedure Committee, the Laws Procedure Committee, to, to have a look at here. Um, because we wouldn't want this to become a, a, a broader precedent. Yeah, can I just pick up on the point you made about um, you know, not all statutory instruments go through this process? I mean, it is important for those people um, who are not that familiar with statutory instruments to appreciate that this, having a debate in, in the way that we're going to have a debate next week, will be a short debate on um, uh, over two days, I think probably be about 90 minutes each, if that, um, is not actually the norm. Uh, most statutory instruments don't have any debate at all, and um, it's not it's not even necessary for statutory instruments to be approved either by res uh, negative or positive resolution. Some statutory instruments just have to be laid, and they just have to sit uh, formally laid before Parliament and are never looked at, never have to be approved um, uh, either by negative resolution or positive resolution procedure. It's true that where there's a Henry VIII clause involved, usually there is positive resolution. Uh, required, but again, that entirely depends on on the way Parliament has chosen to frame the power. Uh, and as I said before, there's no in our jurisdiction, there is no kind of governing, overarching statute or constitutional document that that sets out how um, statutory instruments should be made um, and when um, you have to have positive resolution, negative resolution, and so forth. That's all done by sort of changing. Uh, const uh, changing political um, understandings, um, and ultimately, it's up to Parliament to 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 confer those powers in whatever terms that it that it wants to. I so just wanted to go back on the question of of um, some of the campaigners of raising why wouldn't, as a matter of principle, the opposition vote for Baroness Jones's uh, motion to reject the instruments, given these concerns that we've we've talked about. And um, I think this is where it comes down to sort of the raw politics around mm. um, delegated legislation. 
Um, in the nicest possible way, the Green Party is not going to be forming the next government. Um, and therefore, um, they can act with a, a degree of freedom on these matters that the, the opposition, I think, would probably say they have to think about wider ramifications should they be in government. And um, one of those ramifications, I think, is precisely because, you know, statutory instruments are so rarely rejected. I mean, the House of Commons hasn't rejected one since 1979, the Lords since 2012. In 2015, when you're talking about um, this, this what's, what's called the Strathclyde Review that was introduced, the Lords didn't actually vote against the regulations. It simply declined to consider them. It sort of deferred the, the, the decision on the, the tax credits, a set of tax credits regulations that have been introduced by David Cameron's government. And all hell broke loose with the, the government sort of accusing the, the Lords of a sort of constitutional abuse of their powers, uh, brought in a review uh, to decide whether they should consider whether they should um, continue to have the same powers over statutory instruments um, that they do, but they've never implemented any of the proposals. So there's a sort of view in the House of Lords that um, Lord Lisbane, the former clerk of the House of Commons and, and crossbench peer, calls it the Strathclyde sanction, which now sort of hold, is, is a hold over the House of Lords. A threat that if you uh, if if they uh, reject these uh, reject a reg set of regulations, the the proposals will be will be implemented, and, and in effect. It's a, a sort of a threat to neuter the powers of the House of Lords, such as such as they are. Um, so, so that is a concern. And from a Labour Party perspective, as an aspiring government of the future, they don't want to be in a situation where a precedent has been set of regulations being rejected by the House of Lords, because they are worried, not without some concern, that the future. Conservative Party in opposition would use that as an excuse to do the same. And once, once, the, once you break through that sort of barrier, as it were, of, of, of deciding that you're going to reject thing, reject regulations, it'll become more of a norm and more acceptable. And then the government of the day has got has got a problem. So that's the other sort of constitutional concern. I'm conscious we've got a question from the back uh, from Bob. It's on your podcast, and and. <laughs> Just wait for the microphone, Bob. So if you ask your question, and then we've got some questions online, which we're going to come to. The House of Lords rejected legislation or system um, by, by, by Commons. To enter into law would have to be specific, but it's on by the Speaker. Could that not be challenged on the principle of parliamentary sovereignty? Would it be legally, in fact? Well, we'll come to that in terms of the vulnerability in the courts and the legal effects in relation to sovereignty a bit later, if that's all right. But we'll, we'll because I think that that is a, is a question about whether, whether they can going to be vulnerable to legal challenge. Just one more question. If you're very it's quick. Mr. Hickman. Uh, let's get this right. If I said, Mr. Hickman, aren't you sovereignty and mafia fear justice? Would they expose the uh, doomsday scenario? And what is it? Okay, no, I, I don't think that's particularly relevant to our to our, our case, Bob. Sorry. Questions online? Well, there's, there's one very specific one. Um, uh, um, obviously, you've said that you uh, you don't think that the state promotion will be agreed uh, by the Lords, but um, I think a member of the Lords is inviting us to speculate about um, what would happen if it were. And specifically, is there anything to confirm that there's nothing to prevent the government from continuing back the same way? Yes, that that's that's true. They could they could bring back the the same regulations um, the week after if they wanted to and have another go. So certainly they can do that. Um, there's then, nothing. Then there's you nothing might run into that. the issue about answering the same question twice. Then you might. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's that's possibility. But they could make a change to the regulations, add in something, delete something, um, to to change them uh, slightly, which might might get around it. If not. Transparently abusive. Yes. <laughs> yes procedures of Parliament. Yes, yeah. Um, but yes, no. That that has always been the argument that it's a way of expressing uh, the concern of the House to reject them, but that they can be brought they can be brought back. Okay. So um, I think we've covered um, what will will happen over the next uh, the next few days. Another interesting issue is um, we talked about precedents for the. For the for the government, um, the other precedent in all of this is that um, 
Conservative Party ministers, government ministers, um, they've brought in a lot of skeleton bills with a lot of very broad powers, which now sort of, you know, proliferate all over the statute book. Those powers are going to be available to future ministers in a future government, potentially of a different political stripe. Um, but also, having done this, if this goes through next week, having done this, it does set a precedent that a future government of a different political stripe could do the same thing, potentially. Um, so I think, I think um, although ministers may make a, an argument about why it's necessary to do this in terms of consistency and clarity, they may also be creating a problem for themselves in, 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 in the future. So um, where does this take us? Where does it sort of end up in terms of sort of reflections on executive lawmaking, reflections on the role of delegated legislation, um, the relationship between parliament and, and government, which um, is not in a particularly happy place, particularly in terms of the relationship between the House of Lords and the government at the moment? Yes, well, um, I think there's probably, there's a couple of, certainly a couple of um, different sort of constitutional um, fault lines which are exposed by this. In the first place, you've got the relationship between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And you can look at this whole issue as an example of that tension, the House of Commons wanting to get its way. Of course, we heard the House of Commons actually didn't look at these particular provisions um, when the 2023 Act was going through Parliament because they weren't in the original bill. We don't know why they weren't in the original bill. It appeared to have been something of an afterthought. Um, but the government obviously um, controls the House of Commons and will be saying to the House of Lords next week, you can't reject anything that's gone through the House of Commons. Um, and so you could, one way to look at this is it's another example of that sort of the, the, the now um, age-old uh, tension between the democratically elected chamber and the appointed chamber. Um, the other sort of fault line that I think it exposes is the... Is the issue of parliamentary sovereignty and its relationship to act, governmental acts. Because, you know, what you've got here is you've got a clear expression of Parliament's will in terms of political expression in the 2023 Act. They've clearly, they've looked at this, um, these particular policies, and they've been rejected. But that, that, that rejection isn't itself recorded in the text of the legislation. And so, um, although there is an expression of Parliament's will there in political terms, in legal terms, the 2023 Act you know, it doesn't record the fact that Parliament has rejected this particular uh, policy. And therefore, what's happening, the government can say, is, well, we're not acting inconsistently with the 2023 Act because the expression of Parliament's sovereignty from a legal perspective rather than perhaps a political perspective is simply by looking at the words of an act of parliament. And that's parliament's, that's parliamentary sovereignty, that's the expression of parliament's will. And what we're doing isn't, isn't abusive or isn't um, in conflict with parliamentary sovereignty because there's nothing in the 2023 Act which actually prohibits us from doing this. And I think that exposes um, you know, the, the fact that the notion of parliamentary sovereignty is somewhat amorphous. We, as lawyers, have a fairly strict legal definition but I think it's generally thought of as something a little bit, you know, politically something broader, perhaps constitutionally something broader. And that's why we have this concerning situation where Parliament has looked at something and the government using broad powers that have got nothing particularly um, to do with this precise policy um, is, is able to bring back measures um, and get its own way um, around, as I put, through, or through the back door, I think, as I put it earlier. The other, the other thing I think this raises is a, is a question about the role of the House of Lords versus the government, because it is, it is increasingly doing the, the heavy lifting in terms of legislative scrutiny, both on primary legislation and on, on regulations. Um, and, I mean, it, there are two really good reports by um, the Delegated Powers Committee in the House of Lords and the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee in the House of Lords highlighting many of the issues with, you know, this, this concern about delegated legislation, the, the broader constitutional concerns and practicalities that were published uh, in late 2021, November 2021, I think it was. They're worth a, they're, they're worth a read. Um, and 
um, they they highlight a number of issues, but a couple of them are relevant here beyond the constitutional question. Um, one is one is the quality of information and evidence that's being provided to Parliament. Um, the government doesn't state in the explanatory memorandum to these regulations that, in fact, they have been considered by the House of Lords via the amendments to the Public Order Bill earlier this year and rejected. Um, that appears in, I think, three, sen three lines, a single sentence in paragraph nine of the, of the economic notes that mm. attaches to them. Whether MPs and peers will get to reading the economic note, I don't know. But the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee did, um, and they flagged the fact that this, this is the constitutional, constitutional problem. But the quality of information and evidence, the quality of explanatory memorandums, um, the, the laying of impact assessments at the same time that regulations appear, um, uh, never mind the quality of the information that's then provided in them, is, is an ongoing issue, both for primary legislation and, and, and also for regulations. Um, one of the issues that they also flag is the fact that the government hasn't done any consultation on, on this, dis, this question of serious disruption and the, and the definition. So um, there's, a, there's a wonderful line in the explanatory memorandum that they, the government has consulted with the, the, the policing bodies and um, national highways. And um, this consultation took place in relation to a round table with the prime minister, at which the police, the police obviously made clear their concerns about the consistency. I don't think that was quite necessarily the type of consultation that parliament's perhaps looking for. Yeah. But um, they didn't consult with bodies that would be affected by the regulations. So not just those that will be operationalizing the law to enforce the regulations, but didn't, didn't consult bodies that would be affected, so all the sort of the protest groups and so on. Um, that's something you touch on in your blog as well. And there's a concern, I think, about possible vulnerability to the courts as a result of that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We, we did touch on this. I should say the blog, I co-wrote the blog with uh, Gabrielle Tan. So... Um, although you refer to it as my blog, I should just make make clear that it was uh, co-written. Gabriel uh, may well be on this call, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably listening in. Um, so uh, just to pick up the first point, in terms of the information that provided Parliament, I mean, it is, I think, striking, actually, um, if not rather extraordinary, that the I've got the explanatory memorandum here that was laid with the regulations, um, and it has a section, standard section, um, which is matters of special interest to Parliament. Uh, and underneath uh, the section heading matters of special interest to Parliament, uh, the government has written matters of special interest to the Joint Committee on Statutory Instruments, none. Um, so according, if you just look at the explanatory memorandum, you would not have any inkling uh, of the constitutional issue, major constitutional issue, uh, which arises from the government having... Uh, already lost the argument uh, before Parliament once. Um, so then the question is consultation, as you're right, that the same document uh, records that consultation was um, undertaken with various uh, authorities uh, and entities, but very much on one side of the argument. Um, and here I think is probably the area where the regulations would be most vulnerable um, to legal challenge, because um, although there's no duty on the government to undertake a consultation in relation to regulations or, or indeed any um, executive measure, um, there's a general principle that where the government does engage in a consultation, it must do so in a fair and balanced way. You can't just say, right, we're going to consult, but we're only going to, we're not going to give you an opportunity to respond. And that would be unlawful. Well, we'll consult you, but we won't listen to what you say. Um, or um, you, the government consults uh, simply, you know, one side of, of, of a debate and not the other side. Um, now, there are complications because it's a piece of uh, delegated legislation and it's, it, it, therefore the principles are slightly different. But there are examples, there's a case called Bank Melat, um, which looked at the issue, and that was in the context of a, a delegated legislation that was very specifically targeted at a particular, a particular bank. Um, but the court, what the court did in that case, or the context was very different, is it exploded the idea which had been sitting around in some of the authorities that there's no that there's no need to consult, uh, and the duties on the, the, the case law on consultation has no application at all to statutory instruments, and and the um, Supreme Court said no, that's not right. Just because it's a statutory instrument, 
doesn't mean the case law relating to consultation doesn't apply because it is an executive measure. And the point I made at the beginning, it's an executive measure. It's not um, legislation of parliament. So I think there is some um, some vulnerability on, on, on that issue, but we will, we will have to see if anyone um, seeks to challenge it and what the courts have to say. So, Okay, so we've got some questions, I think, online that are relevant at this stage. Yes, um, there is one um, to revert to the consultation issue. Um, somebody who clearly knows their way around this case is asking what you make of the argument that the government has made somewhere in its documentation um, that um, the re one of the reasons why they didn't consult was that they regarded the debate on the original bill in the House yeah. Lords as the consultation. So I think perhaps you could just respond to that. And then, as I say, there's several questions about uh, picking up further on the legal challenge question. So just sort of what's your view of that argument and the government's part? Yes, I was just, just looking. I've got the, statute, the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee's um, report in front of me. I'm just looking for the relevant paragraph um, because they were, they, were, they were pretty dapping in their wording about they this. They were, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the government makes the case that um, they haven't undertaken a full consultation. They've, they've consulted the police um, bodies. They've con consulted highways, um, the highways agency. Um, and they, they, I don't think they, they necessarily make the point that um, the Lord's debate was in lieu of consultation, but they make the point that it has been considered by, uh, by the House of Lords. Um, and the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee took a fairly dim view of that, I think it's fair to say, on the basis that, yes, but at no point in that paragraph do you point out that the House of Lords said no, and therefore what's changed. So it's a, it's a, it was a very odd, I thought, um, statement to make in yeah. the circumstances. It was was rather surprising. So, um, but I mean, in terms of consultation, I mean, I mean, whilst Parliament, in theory, it, it represents us all. Um, obviously, as a matter of of, of um, reality, um, where delegated powers, whether they're legislative legislative powers like statutory instruments, or they're just powers to make a decision, where they have to be exercised. Um, and consultation is undertaken, you have to specifically consult the relevant affected um, people. Uh, and it's generally not enough just to say, well, um, uh, we've consulted some representative body or I've got some power that's been conferred. So I think that, you know, having decided that there should be consultation, having engaged in some consultation, I don't think it's really an answer to say, well, in respect of all the other interests, uh, we don't need to worry about those because you know parliament's had a look at this um and indeed in any legal proceedings would be an interesting question about whether they could even make that point um because that would involve uh, delving into proceedings in parliament yeah i found the paragraph in the secondary legislation scrutiny committee reports it says while important a debate in parliament is not a substitute for in-depth consideration by a range of interested parties and those with expert knowledge at the policy formulation stage. Moreover, the House of Lords expressed its view by rejecting the measures, yet they have been brought back as unchanged. And, um, and the House of Lords committee also reminds the government that their own sort of consultation principles state that they should consider the full range of people, business and voluntary bodies affected by the policy. And obviously that, that is not um, what's happened here. It's um, in an economic note accompanying the regulations, the Home Office acknowledges that a wide range of groups will be affected, including the public and protesters, but it hasn't consulted, consulted those groups. So, yes, that, that, that is a, an issue of concern. Any further questions, Bridget? Um, if we've got time, um, then yes, there, there are several questions, I think, probably for, for Tom, just about, about, about picking up this issue about legal, legal challenge. There, there are various people who are just interested in general about where you think there might, might be the most mileage or the possible strongest uh, grounds for challenging the regs. Um, the people, you know, they're looking for, for different well, I, I said, free I advice. Said, not, <laughs> <laughs> um, there is one specific um, possibility raised by um, Gavin Phillipson, who's an academic lawyer at the University of Bristol. Never heard of him. Uh, <laughs> some member in this room will know. Um, he's interested in whether or not there's any mileage in in the using the frustration principle on the grounds that 
Parliament said it didn't want this, and now yeah. this is being brought forward anyway. Um, and somebody's also asking whether there's any international angle on, the, on this in terms of international obligations on about the right to protest. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, I think in principle, there's there's sort of three. Um, sites of possible legal argument there's the there's a the consultation one which we've, we've spoken about uh, and i think i've indicated that you know i i think that's um that raises some some issues um i wouldn't say i've thought through thought them all through um to the nth degree um the second uh, possibility is that one says well the delegated power that the government's exercised uh, isn't sufficiently ample uh, to allow it to make these particular changes to the Public Order Act 1986. Um, and and the, the argument would, would go along the following lines, that the, the delegated power allows um, the government to um, give examples uh, of serious disruption and allow it to uh, provide some sort of extra colour and a bit of extra... Um, uh, detail to the meaning of serious disruption, but you can't actually just uh, effectively take serious disruption and turn it into something else. You can't you can't obliterate it and turn it into minor um, some sort of minor disruption. Um, the difficulty with that argument, or potentially, is that the, the delegated powers is always the way delegated powers are framed quite broadly. Uh, they allow the delegated powers to define. Um, the term, but a definition of term, I think, unless Parliament has conferred power uh, to allow um, a definition of a term to change the ordinary meaning, it might not um, stretch that far. There might be some arguments around that. The other or a potential site of legal argument is the one we, we, we do point to in the blog and that um, Gavin has raised, which is about frustration um, of the... 2023 Act. Now, although the 2023 Act doesn't say anything in terms um, that, pre that prevent um, the exercise of the delegated power to change serious disruption, um, there could be an argument that uh, the, two, the policy and the purpose of the 2023 Act is clear enough from its face, and you may be able to look at some of the wider materials to explore that. It, it has changed um, the meaning of serious disruption in the 1986 Act in relation to offences. So it's made a number of changes, but it's left untouched the police powers. In fact, it has made some amendments to police powers provisions, but not changing the serious disruption. So you might be able to construct an argument that said, well, therefore, trying to make changes that go beyond that frustrates the policy of the 2023 Act. I think, as we indicated in the blog, that the, the difficulty is really that the way the courts, to date anyway, have quite liberally construed Henry VIII's powers. They, 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 they have allowed those powers to be exercised, I think, um, in, in a quite broad range of circumstances. They haven't taken a very strict approach. So I think sort of arguments of that nature may, may have difficulties, but I'm not going to go into great details uh, but I th certainly think there are avenues to explore uh, whether anyone will want to will consider that there's a sufficient merit in any of those to bring a challenge is entirely another matter. Okay, well, with that, thank you, Tom. Um, I think we'll draw it to a close now because we've, we've, we've reached the hour mark. So can I thank everyone for joining us online, for joining us here at Blackstone Chambers? Can I thank the team at Blackstone Chambers who've managed all the tech and, and organised today and my colleagues at Society, Bridget and Luke, who put it all together in a very short period of time. Thank you to Tom for taking part. Much appreciated. It's part of our ongoing sort of campaign to raise awareness about the challenges and problems with delegated legislation and hopefully bring about some some reform. Um, we'll be commentating commenting a lot more on these issues as we publish our final proposals from our delegated legislation review. So if you're not already on our newsletter subscription list, do join hansarsociety.org.uk forward slash connect. It's easy to do. Um, and um, in addition to, to that, uh, those proposals will also be announcing two new major projects in relation to parliamentary reform. So um, if you're interested in and um, care about parliament, want it to be more effective than it is now, um, do, do sign up. Before I go, can I just thank uh, 
uh, a number of people online who have made very generous donations to the society in relation to this event is much appreciated. Um, and if you found today useful, then why not consider joining the society? We have uh, we can do it for as, as little as a cup of coffee once a month. So, um, and we've got actually a number of, of members uh, from Blackstone Chambers and, 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 and other legal um, firms as well as um, parliamentarians and, uh, and civil society groups. Just finally, our next event will be a training event in relation to the retained EU law bill. So uh, again, if, you, uh, if you're interested in that, if professionally that affects your, your work and you need to get on top of exactly how that's going to be implemented, then that's our next event. Um, and if you're signed up to our newsletter, you'll be able to, to get the details and it'll be on our website. So with that, can I thank everybody for joining us um, and uh, look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you very much.